we'd like to welcome back Dennis, who was with us last year, who's going to turn us a couple of items tonight. Cheers. Good evening, everyone. And yes, it's nice to be back. Um, I think this is about the third time that I've been here in a roundabout way, because I think I did a Zoom meeting for you the year before. I'm not certain. But um, yeah, at my place, I've got a small shop as well as my workshop and tutoring centre. So if anybody wants to have a look at my website and if there's anything there that you see, get in touch with us. Not everything's on the photos on the shop side, but please get in touch if there's anything that you want that you feel that uh, I may have contacts for. Uh, but more, more about tonight. I'm hopefully going to turn three items. A hinged trinket box. Not exactly like this, but this is the, the hinges that I'm selling at the back. Uh, this is the 80 mil. There is a 60 mil. You can also get, I think it's a 70 and 100 mil uh, available. So we're going to do that first. Then once we finish that, we will do the red post box money box, which is uh, kindly been offered to me as a demonstration by Tony Wilson a few years ago when, when we did see Tony about on the circuit. And he used to come over to help for heroes at Phoenix House. He offered me the opportunity of using that as a demonstration as long as I said that it was his design and that and rightly so i think if we do anything of other people's even if we post it on facebook that we've had a go at it please represent the person that's done the design it's highly critical of people that some of them will ask you to take the post down if you don't i'm not that critical that way but and hopefully if we've got time at the end of the night we will do just a small basic apple. Now, I used to do my apples from a piece of three and a half, three by three, and up to the point of meeting the Martin pigeon, I got told off for using too much material. So we'll lead on to that later on when we get round to doing the apple. But firstly and foremost, one of the things that we should always think about is our own safety as well as others. So while you're at it, any of the machinery in your workshop, at your shop or anywhere, we should always wear the safety gear provided. Normally I wear a face shield, but wearing the face shield predominantly bounces the, sp the speech back at me and you don't understand it. So I've got safety glasses on. And for the items that I'm doing tonight, I feel that I'm adequately, adequately, okay, protected, that one. <laughs> um, <clears throat> secondly, we should always use our tools correctly. Now, because I've got the, most of these items are going to be on spindle work to start with, then we can use the spindle rough and gouge now, how many of you would contemplate using that on a ball? Hopefully nobody. A couple of years ago, I did a demonstration at another club, and I said exactly the same. How many of you would use it on a ball? Oh, no, no, no. A week later, I got a shattered spindle rough and gouge sent to me, and the person said in the letter that was with it, after this come off, and, and went past my lug hole. Everything you said resonated with me. So be very, very careful. We should only use the spindle rough and gouge when the grain orientation is from headstock to tailstock. When it's cross-directional, we should use a ball gouge, nothing more, especially nothing more than in that sense. So we're going to get started. The next thing we need to worry about is speed. You always try and remember and turn the speed down when we're finished. That way, when we come back, which could be potentially an hour later, or it could be two to three weeks later, at least we know that when we put something on and press that start button, 
it's not going to come off on us. Because guaranteed, if you don't, the first thing you'll do is put something really large on, large outer shape, ball blank. You'll press the start and you'll go like so that. Hopefully it'll miss you. So get into a habit of turning the speed down or get into a habit of checking what the speed is. There is a readout on here and I try and turn most of my lathes down to around about 700-ish. Now I feel comfortable at that for whatever I put on. Mine will, my lathes will take 16 inch over the bed and even if it's out of balance, you've still got the time because mine's the variable speed with the dial. This one, you've got to press the up and down button. So you've probably got less time on here to correct the speed than you have on the, the lathes I've got because it's inst instantaneous. Where this, as you all see, is very slow in adjusting. So get into a habit of these and you'll save yourself a lot of heartache. So we're starting at 700-ish. I've got everything set. The tail stock's locked off. The tool rest, banjo's locked off and the tool rest locked off at a height that I can pick the cut up on or around center line. Now I want to turn the speed up. I want to start off at around about 1300 to take the corners off here. So you can see how slow it is to move. That's on 1100 now. So if that was a piece that was out of balance, you'd have probably hit the stop button and be panicking. So I'm a little bit more. So I'm happy with that. That's just under, just under 12. So now I'm ready to turn. So when you turn initially, until you gain confidence and understand what your cut is doing, always start from on the material. Because at least then, if anything goes wrong, it's going to push your tool away from the wood. If I presented the tool there and I presented it too far in, that is as dangerous as hitting a cross-directional ball because that's going to throw you up. You're going to push down and constantly doing that will snap the handle on, on the tang. So if we start, I'm left-handed, so obviously start as close to the edge as possible. That way, when we reverse, to be doing this right-handed, we've only got a small amount to take off. So nice wide stance. What we're going to do is we're going to move our weight from my left leg across to my right leg. I'm not going to rotate my hips because what will happen is you'll take a cut, you'll take a bigger cut in the center, and you come out on the edge. So you've got both ends wider than the center. So if we take a cut, slide the tool through my fingers, pick the cut up, Huh? All the way to the down? end. The cutting edge is off the material, mm -hmm. but I haven't took the tool off the material because I know now where the material is. Because if I took it off, I've got to find it again. I'll pick the cut up. So by knowing where the material is, I can come back and the loud banging will tell me that I'm back to start. Slide the tool through. Come back. As you're getting smaller and smaller, that wedge at this end will get bigger and bigger because as you're trying to push in, your bevel is pushing you to the right or the left, whichever hand you are using. So we end up with a cone like so that. Yeah. When the gap between the tool rest and the material gets too great and a position that our fingers can slide over and drop in, then that's dangerous. So we need to move the tool rest in. But because of this area here, we can't do that. So what we'll do, change right-handed. And this time, we present the tool on the left-hand side of the material so the heel of the tool will find the material first Slide it in and take a cut. If we tried to take a cut here straight in, 
we will try and take too much off and it'll do a couple of different things. It'll chip the wood out and take too much material out. It will drag you and drag you down. So by finding out where it is, you know that you're not going to take too much off and come back. So all you're going to do now is come back. And level it up to the rest. Once we've got it like so that, I don't know whether you can see, but that is rocking slightly. What's happened there is because of the cuts I've took, I've caused stress on the teeth and it's opened the joints up slightly. So the way of getting rid of that, release your tail stock, little bit of pressure, lock your tail stock back off and check it. Now it's solid. But before I go any further, I'm going to change the tool rest over because the long overhang on this, I can't get my position right. So I can now move my tool rest into position. Because I want this parallel as a parallel piece, I'm sighting through the tool rest onto the bed bars and I'm locking it off. I can now turn the speed up. I'll turn it up to around about 1600, but also check that the vibration of the lathe is okay. 1450, that's fine. I can now take a cut from this end because I've took the danger points away and I can present the tool. So a nice low hand, my left hand down into my hip, pick the cut up, travel, come back. Several ways we can check that this is round. One we've just done, we've stopped it. The other one, we can use the back of the tool that's not round, obviously. That's the difference between the round. So, put a couple of more cuts. And obviously, as well, I can still see the pencil line. So, while I can see the pencil line, means that there's still some flat areas there. Stop the lathe. Check it. Still a little bit of a flat. But I know that I'm going to be shaping down to there. So the next job I need to do is put a chuck and point on both ends and then split this into two. I've set my calipers at the size of my jaws, which is 56 mil. So I want to drop them past, so I'll use the width of the tool, the part and chisel. I'll keep it nice and parallel. Pick the cut up and just push forward and raise my back hand slightly. Get rid of the waste that's left on there. Small amount more. We go. Same on this end. Now, what's happened on this end? I wasn't quite square, so actually, it's radius it slightly. So I need to correct that so that I've got a good position on the on the jaws. So just come round a little bit more. Square into it. The next job I need to do is split this into two. Because I'm going to do a trinket box. I want two thirds of it as the base and a third of it as the lid. So, what I'm going to do is have a look, see which of the grain orientation is the better. It's more or less parallel, so it doesn't really matter. So, I'm going to part off at around about there. 
So drop my back hand, slide the tool across till it picks the line up. Raise my back hand and push forward. Come out. Open the gap very, very fractionally. The smaller you make the gap, the more chance you've got of getting the orientation of the grain matching. So I've gone into where I was and I've gone past. So keep doing that. And what, I, what I want to do is split this into two. But because that step center is sprung, I don't want to go all the way through parting it off because the first thing that will happen is the material will snap, go nip onto the tool, and then I've got to get from there to the stop button. So what I do is I turn until I've got approximately the thickness of my little finger left in the center. And we can then try and break it free by hand. If we can't, we feel comfortable enough, then turn in a bit further. But listen to the resonance of the material. It will change resonance and it'll tell you that it's just about to snap. Wider grain ones will snap earlier than tighter grain like the beach sycamore they'll turn a lot smaller so all i'm going to do now is just carry on so i'm just zigzagging all the way down just backing off slightly each time so i can see and hear the resonance changing now so i'm going to stop the lathe i'll back the tail stock off slightly Still can't, so back it back in, tighten it off. Start again. Very, very fine put. Listening to the lathe, listen to the timber. And then don't do that. <laughs> you see how easy and how quick it can happen? Actually, I've got a really small little finger. <laughs> I'm going to take the drive away. And I'm now going to Mount the bottom piece onto the lathe and move the tail stock out the way. Axminster's done us a favor on sizing the, the jaws because what they've done is they've made the jaws the same size as the body. That then gives you the indication of that it's round. Obviously, not all of them but 90% of them are. So what I've got to do is turn the spade down slightly because I've remounted it, but I don't know whether that's mounted in safely. So by turning the spade down, standing to the side and turning it on, then we know that it's balanced and we can turn the spade back up again. Will it finish the night before it gets up to speed? So what I want to do now is part into it so that I can get the hinge to fit. Now I always use the bottom of the hinge because with the butterfly on the hinge, when you're trying it on, it catches on the timber so you can't get a good indication. But by using the base, you can. Locked everything off. And I'm using half the width of the tool. And this is a, the usual stop start until you get it fitted. We want to try and get this nice and tight.
There we go. While I've got it there, I will get the pencil and I will mark the approximate position that I'm going to take the waste away. Reposition my tool rest across the face. So I want to be able to pick center line up. I'm going to use the spindle gouge and I'm going to use it parallel so that I can push in, tip the tool over so my right hand is going the, the controlling of the cut. My left hand is is controlling the movement. So what I'm doing is I'm using the palm of my hand up against the tool rest. I'm using my right hand to push in and tip it over. And I'm going to use my fingers to, to pull into a fist. When I get so far out, I'm going to tip the tool over slightly because the radius of the spindle gouge end is rolling. So if we kept doing that, then it would just go into a cone in the centre, and we don't want that initially. I do want to go that sort of shape, but initially I want to start working down the side. So let the lathe get up to speed. Push in over, tip it over, close my fist. Up to the line. Push in, tip it over. Don't try and take too much off. The first thing the tool is going to do is start squealing at you. In. I'm going to keep digging it down like of this until I get to a position where I'm happy with the depth. Says your yeah, battery's running low or something. At some point, this tool is going to start squealing like mad. It's off now. You can it's gone keep off now. Yeah. With it, keep going. Depending on the size, there's sometimes you can move your tool rest further in and use the, the end of the tool rest inside. Or I can go to a carbide tip, which is going to give me more strength. I'll keep cutting uh, with this at the moment. Yeah. Down to squeal now. One thing, if we get a pip in the center and we're struggling to get it, it'll kick, kick your tool across. Just turn it back so that the flute is pointing to the 12 o'clock. Raise your back hand and go underneath it. By doing that, you can nibble at it back into center line. So pick it up underneath, up to center line, push in over. I'm going to start struggling with that now. So I'll change over to the carbide tool. Because the carbide tool is a solid bar, we've got more strength. We've got more stability. I've got a round nose cutter. Pick the cut up on center line. And the easiest way I find to use this is because it's a scraper in a, in a sense, we want to have that tip lower than the back of the handle. So by laying it across your forearm, cradling it like you would a baby, you've automatically put it in the right orientation. So pick center line up, push in over.
what I'm starting to do now is I know what shape I want. So I'm starting to shape the bottom of the inside of the box. Push it in. Stop the lathe and have a look. Huh. Yeah, can go a bit deeper. I'm happy with that, but I want to clean this down a little bit better. So I'm going to use a scraper to refine the shape. Now on my scrapers, I sharpen them from the front all the way around and up the side. Because at the end of the day, we're not using any of this side of the tool at all, but we're using the tip and all around this side, especially if you're doing the likes of goblets inside trinket boxes, especially smaller ones. We can use that as a shear scrape as we're coming down the side. Same again, lay the tool across the forearm. Tool's a little bit too low. So raise the tool rest so that we can pick the center up, but have that tool at the right angle. That will reduce the chance of a dig in. Because of the overhang, so gradually, Find out where it is. And I'm just going to lay my left hand across the tool. I don't want to be taking much off at all. I want to let the tool do the work. And in the case, what I'm thinking about is taking nothing off. It may sound daft, but if you grab hold of the tool for one, you're going to gouge that round. If you lay your hand on the top and just lay it on and run it round, then it's going to take the finest of cuts. So back on the center. Nice and fine. All the way out. Stop the lathe. With a scraper, you're far better sharpening it just before you use it it will give you a far better finish on it. There's a little bit of a, a mark there at the bottom that I want to take off. It will reduce the amount of sand you need to do as well. Because obviously, when we sand, we should only sand from a grit that is going to clean down better than what your tool finish is. So we now can... Up. Turn your speed down for sanding. I normally do it at around about the same speed as I do when I start the lathe off. So around about the 700 mark. Thank you. So for the finish that I've got there, I certainly wouldn't use the 80 grit or the 120. I would try the 180 and see how it finishes. So I've turned that down, it's at around about 800. Using it on this quarter of the, the lathe closest to you, that way the dust will get pulled away from you, especially if you've got the extraction on. And just work through all the grits. Don't miss any out. Because all you're doing is asking for trouble. You'll not clean down to the highest degree that you want. And I'm sanding down through to 600. I'm not touching the end. I'm not touching the part that I've just put as a joint for the, the ring. That doesn't need touching at all. Just the inside.
And as you're getting further down the grit, you don't need to sand, or you shouldn't need to sand as much as the one before, because all you're doing is taking this, taking the scratches off that you've just put on. A little bit of tear out there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop down to the 120. Because I've got two grits left beforehand, I can do that and I can clean down a little bit better. And it's only this area here, right near the front, that I need to really touch. So keep the, the sandpaper moving. Don't keep it on because all you'll do is get rings and then work back through the grits again. If you've got stubborn grain that's tore out and the rest is sanding up nicely, you can use your sanding sealer. And what we do is the where the tear out is, put your sanding sealer on just in that area, nothing else. Wipe the excess off and dry it out and then sand it down. What you'll find is the sanding sealer will dry and harden the gray, grain and it'll give it an opportunity of sand knack first before the other. So I'm going to put a coat of sand and sealer on the inside. And when you leave your sand and sealer, it, the residue will go at the bottom. So remember to give it a good shake up. And remember to take the bottle lid off, not the black pipe fitting or cable fitting, like everybody seems to d want to do. Just do not know why. Always put the bottle out of your way. If, you've got, if you're anything like me, if you leave it in the way, the first thing it's going to do is be on the floor. And it's expensive enough to get the sand and sealer and the stuff that we use as it is without having to mop it up with shavings. So wipe the excess off. We also want to get the lathe on and back up to a speed that we were turning or thereabouts. Fast enough. And we're going to burnish the inside. Use a paper towel. You can also use shavings as long as you know that it's just shavings. There's nothing metal, nothing abrasive in it. The first thing you're going to do, pick something up that is going to wreck what you've just done. It's going to scratch it. <clears throat> and I haven't brought a finish. So passes one of them finishes down, please. Okay. I knew that was coming. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I know what. Shows that my Chris line. Good job, bro. A broad stock, isn't it? Yeah. So first, first demo in about four or five months. So you you lose track of what you need. So I'm going to use some micro crystalline on it. don't need much of this. Now, the thing with microcrystalline is it's hard wearing, whereas the, the Hampshire Shane High Gloss or your Wood Wax 22 is a nice shiny finish. But every time you pick it up, you will leave finger marks on it where the, the microcrystalline is harder wearing and it will give a harder wearing for longer. So you can pick it up and 
your finger marks won't stain it. They'll and it'll give a nice shine on it. So that's the inside done. And the main thing, put the lid on it. Don't just put it to the side. As you can guarantee, when I start turning this down to shape, that'll fill up. Doesn't matter where it is. So we're going to reposition our tool rest. And we're now going to start shaping the outside. When we're shaping the outside, we want to replicate the shape of the inside, if that's what shape we want to do. So I want to cone it in to quite a small foot, but not too small that it's always going to fall over. You've still got to look at balance. So I'm going to use the ball gouge. And I'm going to start cutting. But initially, I'm going to start cutting so that I can get the hinge to fit. And when it fits, the, sh the outer part of the hinge and the body of the wood is in line with each other. So I'm just going to take a few small cuts at the end just to pick that up and see if I can get that shape. Don't need to do any more than that. Because once we've got the shape there, we can follow on. That wasn't a bad guess, was it? So we can now start taking the shape. As I say, I'm going to taper it in. So I want to start taking a cut further down, get rid of some of the waste. I can turn the speed up a little bit as well. When you press the right button, that is. So at around about 1,300. So... Remember to lock your tool rest off fully so that it doesn't do that. All I'm doing is getting rid of the way. Remember to stop short of where the waste is that you've just done because if you don't, that wing is going to catch it, flick your tool, and also take that out of the lathe and throw it out. And it's de definitely going to come your way. So start thinking of where you're going and what you're stopping at. Or the bevel rubbing at all times. I'm going to stop the lathe because also what I want to do is check the wall thickness. The bottom is still quite thick. Wall thickness here is, is starting to get just right. So I'm going to take an, some more cuts from down here to start swinging it round a little bit more. And start right the way back up here now. Start swinging the shape round, the it. So I want to take it further down now, but the material's in the way, so I'll take a cut from the other side and just push in over, get rid of some of it. Back onto this side, get rid of some of the way. I've got a little bit of vibration there, so it's going to try and pick that foot up. That's it. Get rid of the way. By getting this down as close to finishing point as possible will help me when I reverse it. A little bit thick there, so I'm going to 
try and bring this round a little bit further. That's better. Two things to remember, you've, you've taken it in further than the bottom where you've scooped it, it out so that you've got material left to do the base of it. And we can sand that down because when we reverse it, we're going to put this side close to the jaws, and which is one thing that I forgot to do. I need to put a small position here so that I can put a chucking point because these jaws won't open wide enough to go on the outside what I'm going to need to do is put a small point on the inside so that I can expand onto I don't want much so I'm going to use a round skew and just going to push in over It's what you get when you use a different lathe than what you're used to day in, day out. And that's excuses. No, it's not really. But it is. You, you can go to a demonstration, like you will go to a demonstration out in wherever close, and you've got two lathes. Both lathes are different. You'll go on the first one, you'll start turning the controls are here. So you go on the other one later on and you go. And it's it's all over the place. So, right, I'm just going to put that little chuck and point in. So, I can move that out the way now. I can sand that down. I'm going to turn the spade down. I'm going to start from the 180 again. Keep it moving. You don't need to touch any on that spigot that the joint's going to be on. The hinge is going to be on. And as I say, it all depends what grade you start of how good the quality of finish is off your tool. The thing with the wider grained materials, it lends itself to being able to put the likes of the embellishing waxes on. Now, the one way I've found of when I do the embellishing waxes, I've sanded it down to finish, but then I'd wire, I'd not wire brush, I'd soft brush the grain, get rid of all the dust inside the grain. Then I would put your, your wax on, because that then will go into the grain and it'll fill the grain pores up. So go with the grain and against the grain and fill them up. Then when you polish it, all the excess wax will come off and it'll leave the wax in the grain as an embellishing. Then you can put your finish on top of it. So I'm happy with the finish there. So I'm going to coat the sand and sealer. I am going to sand it down again when I do the bottom. But I shouldn't need to do... Any more sand on the side. So just coat. Get your sand and sailor on quite fast. You don't have to take your time over it because the longer you take over it, the more it's going to start drying, the more it's going to start drying. Gloopy, thick in places, thin in others, and then you've got to try and sand it back to, to clean that back again or use your Yorkshire grit to cut it in. So straight away, wipe the excess off. 
Get the speed back up. I've diluted it 50-50. Uh, it does say on the tins that it's it can be used straight from the tin. Personally, I think it's too thick. That's both the Yorkshire, the Hampshire Sheen one and the Chestnut one. Hampshire Sheen say it's 50-50 ready to use. I still thin it down a little bit. Uh, the Chestnut one, I definitely put... <coughs> excuse me. I put the same amount of each in the bottle. But as I say, they, they say you don't need to, but it's only personal preference. So I've turned that up to about a 1,000. Give it a bit of a burnish. Get rid of all the hard bits. You can tell when you've got this on because it darkens off, it goes dull. So you know that you've got it in the areas that you require it. And as I say, make sure you put the lid back on it. Clean piece of paper towel this time. <clears throat> I'm going to turn the speed up a little bit more and polish it off. Keep the paper moving. So that's the bottom more or less done. Before we take it off, just one last check that when the hinge shuts, it goes over the top of the material, which it does. So I'm happy with that. So I can now reverse this. The one thing I'm going to do is put the tail stock in because I want to make sure that this is central and this is probably where the fun starts I've tightened that up just sufficient to hold it. I'm going to turn the speed down so that I can check that it's all secure. Tail stock's in, locked off, everything's tight. And I'll step to the side. Yep. Happy. <clears throat> I'm going to change the position of the tool rest. Because initially I want to get rid of all this waste. I'll get rid of the wider part first, and then I'll start on the chuck and point. So actually, I should be able to get in close that way. I'm going to use the, butt, the spindle gouge, because I don't want to be taken too much off. Now that I know it's balanced, I can turn the speed back up again. Nearly 1,200. Nice small cut. You don't want to be trying gouging this off because the first thing you'll do is get a cap and it will take it out the lathe. You can guarantee it. We'll stop the lathe, reposition the tool rest. What time do you just have a break? What time is it now? <clears throat> All I'm doing is getting rid of the waste. Noticing the tail stops come off slightly.
So I'm going to stop the lathe. I'm going to reposition the tool rest. But I'm also going to nip that up a little bit more because it's vibrating slightly. Put the tool rest so it goes underneath the tailstock. And we're going to start scooping across the bottom. And we're same again, we're going to use the spindle gouge. Don't want to be taking large cuts off this. That's not going to get in, so I'll change over to I'll just move the tailstock back so that I can get the tool rest in place. So that I can take a cut underneath. So all I'm going to do is to find cuts towards the, the tailstock but I'm going to leave a cone on the bottom so that the tailstock is supporting it at all times. Small cuts. Now that I've got a bit of the waste away, I can now move the tool rest in and up slightly again. I can get it closer to where I want it. Whenever you move the tool rest, always get into a habit of moving your material at least one full revolution just to make sure that it misses the tool rest. So there's a small amount of sand in there I'm going to need to do. There's a little bit of a lip there as well. So before I go any further with taking that off, I want to correct that. I'll get the tool rest in. And then just pick the bevel up, run into the cut, and take the cut. That's all I needed. Now I can reposition the tool rest back around the center on the base. So all I need to do now is undercut this very slightly. In fact, by the looks of that, it is. Yeah. So all I need to do now is take the spigot away. So I'm going to pick smaller cuts a little bit further back. I'm gradually come in towards the material and get rid of this. It should come off as a little pip. Once I get down to the bottom, a little bit more off it. Get my spindle gouge right the way over onto a knife edge. And all I need to do now is the finest of cuts to clean that down, coming through center as I finish. Tool rest out the way. Lathe speed back down. And sand the base off. No use putting that on and not putting it in place.
when you put more sand and sailor on around the sides, always put another coat of finish on it. <laughs> Excuse me. I find it's best putting the, the finish on with the lathe stationary. I feel you can get a better coating on it, unless it's really, really small stuff, where it probably takes you longer to stop the lathe to do it than to put it on. A little bit of a coat further up. <clears throat> Turn the speed back up. Turn the speed back up to where you're turning because you need the, the heat to get the wax moving. If you do it slow, you, you've got to pr put more pressure on it. So that's the base part of it done. Now to remember which way you take it off so you don't crack it. Then just before we finish, can we show us the figures on the inside so you can see what you're holding? On, on yeah. So all I've got is, I'll be passing this around anyway, but all I've done is I've put a very small point, no more than a quarter of an inch, not even a sixteenth of an inch anyway. You don't need much because you, if you've got it right, at the right size, then your tail stock's going to take most of the support anyway. And then at the last second, as you've seen, take, take, that spigot, uh, take that pip off and then clean the last little bit down. So that's the base done. When we start for the top, I've put the piece of material in, I've turned the speed down and I've turned it on just to make sure that I've got it balanced and it's okay, it's not going to come out. And now I've turned the speed back up a little bit. I'm going to go to about 1300. And I'm going to part into it so that the lid, the hinge fits onto the material. So it's exactly the same as I did before. So half the width of the tool. Stop the lathe and try it. This is one of the reasons why I don't glue this to the base. Because if I do that, I've got to use the part with the butterfly on it. And it won't fit on because the butterfly gets in the way. So by using the ring, as I said earlier, so turn it back on. And it is a case of stop start until you get it on. The better you get it fitted, the better it looks the more pleasing it looks. I'm saying that I've probably gone too far now. Oh, no. A little bit tight. So it's a case of very, very fine shavings now. There we go. So while it's on, same as earlier, find my pencil and mark the ring. Because I'm going to undercut this, get rid of some of the waste, the same as I did with the body. But obviously, I don't need to take it as deep because I've only got a small quantity there. So I'll reposition the tool rest. I will keep with this one. It's just it's not too bad. Same again. Work on center line. Because I've got that little pip, I'll take that away first. Pick the cut up, push in over, twist it over and pull it towards us. In over, push it towards us. So 
So I've still got a little bit I can take off because the pencil line's there. One more cut and then I'm off here. What I'm going to do this time, I'm going to use the flat nose scraper. The same again. I've sharpened down the side, so when I push in at this edge, I'm going to give it a nice crisp finish. I'm going to raise the tool rest up so that I can work on center line. And I'm going to push in from the line. I'm going to keep it as parallel to the body as I possibly can. Got to the bottom and gradually just work towards the center. Pick the center up. And all I'm doing is getting rid of the waste. We don't want the lid too heavy. As soon as you open it, it's just going to flop back. I could probably take that down another half an inch, actually. So I, I may as well do it. I may as well lighten the load as much as possible. It'll only take a couple of more cuts. So represent, raise the tool rest up. Probably a little bit too high. And clean the waste away. Make sure you've got the tool the right orientation. And then sand it down. Happy with that. Turn the speed down. And get into a habit of turning the speed up and down for whatever you're doing. You'll benefit from it because if you start turning you, the likes of that, if you turn that, sorry, if you start sanding that at too high a speed, you will produce what's called heat checks. Splits that's in the wood already that's keeping closed because it's nice and cool. But as soon as you produce the heat, it'll just pop. And you can guarantee it will not go back together. It'll stay there and it'll be in your face all the time. So get the speed right the way down. Uh, for you, I normally sand at around about four, five hundred and it works well. So I've turned the speed down there. Just a quick sand, doesn't need much. If your tool presenting is good and you've got a nice crisp finish on your on your partners and your flat nose scraper, you'll get a really good finish on it anyway. <clears throat> the beauty of doing this parallel as well is I don't need to put a little chuck and point on the inside because I've got one already. It was only on the bottom because of it being slightly radiused. Thing with doing a flat bottom as well in it is it's hard to get the finish right on that because you can't get the sandpaper across to sand the base. So you've just got to hope that the finish that you've put on it with the scraper with really fine cuts cleans it up nicely. So same again, wipe the excess off. Get the speed back up. And burnish it off. Give it a rub over, stop the lathe, and a coat of microcrystalline.
as I say, get into a habit of putting the lid on it. You will regret it if you don't. Now, there's a little bit of tear out in the bottom there, which has dragged the paper. So you may, may need to pick the paper out of it. So now I need to take a cut along the face to true it up so that it's going to look in line with the body, with the base. So I'm going to use the ball gouge. Pick the cut up. And we can this time carry on all the way down. Once you get close to your chuck, either stop short or slow right the way down to a more or less stop. Then you're in control. Whenever you're doing cuts towards your chuck and you're going to do that sort of cut, make sure that the tools are sharp. If they're not, what you'll find is you're pushing the tool through the wood then all of a sudden it shoots off on you and there's no way you can control it. So have a nice, clean, sharp chisel. I'm going to check that how much I need to take off. A little bit more, but what am I? Yeah, still need to take more off because that hinge doesn't shut. So when I put it on, it's not going to fit right. And the shape of these trinket boxes is totally up to you what size and shape you do them. Right, that's happy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the grain orientation and decide which way I'm going to have it when the hinge is on. And I'm going to lay it together and have a look and see if there's anything of it that needs changing. I'm happy with that. Barring the position that that hinge, whether it's twisted slightly or not, I don't know, but it's not wanting to sit properly in there. So... Rather than taking a cut, what I'm going to do, I'm going to use the 180 and I'm just going to rub that spigot that I've put on. And I'm just going to rub it very, very lightly. So don't want much off. And you can guarantee that as soon as you present the tool to it, you're going to take too much off. That's better. So you can see by just doing that, just a quick rub, I'll get you where you need to be. So the sides is finished. It's just the top. You need to know how deep you've gone on the inside and what you're going to do on the outside. So that now can be reversed. Obviously, I said earlier I would sand and finish this firstly before I reverse it. But when I reversed it, I found that when this was on that way, it was clearer the the chuck jaws so I was safe to sand it that way around I didn't need to sand it and finish it first before reversing it so I can reverse this in the safe reassurance that I'm not going to get my fingers in the way so then I can turn the top of it and I can sand and finish the full lot together It goes all the way back to the, the jaws and just nip it off. If you feel uncomfortable, you can bring your tail stock up against it. I think this head is just slightly out of center. That I can tell by that the tail stock is just this side of the center mark that I was holding it on centers, but I'm not bothered because I've got sufficient there to hold it that, to be truthful, I wouldn't use that, but I'm just showing you that there is a method that you can do to hold it if you're unsure of exactly what, how comfortable you are with your turning. 
So I'm going to radius this slightly. Now, I'm going to use a spindle gouge again because I do want to take small cuts. Everything's happy. So I'll start off with the chucking point and I'll start taking that away. I've set the tool rest slightly at an angle so that the tool rest is more or less in the orientation that I want to be cutting. So then all I need to do is pick the cut up, use the palm of my hand and my front knuckle on my little finger, and basically lean forward. When you're leaning forward, have the bevel rubbing. Come back. And all it is is leaning forward into it. You can do all sorts of finishes on the top. You can put a uh, ceramic insert into it. You can put another different colored timber into it. You can do all sorts. It basically, it's up to you what you do to it of the shape and size. So that cut then has gone right from the outside. I want to make sure that I'm going to take that center point out so I'm slowing right the way down and aiming to have my finish come through centre. Look at the finish. The only, only part that I've got there that is uneven is the difference in grain. There's no spiral lines. There's no finish and stopping of the cut picking up and not. It's just pick that cut up at the end and by using the palm of your hand and that knuckle, just hold the tool, lock it into your body and lean forward. You'll get a nice crisp finish on it. So that is ready for sanding. And as I say, I can now sand both the inside, uh, sorry, the side and the lid together. Keep it moving. Little bit of pressure on it. And I've started again on the one, 180. And I'll work right the way through to the 600. If I was going to put a spirit stain on this, then I would only sand for 320. You start sanding higher than that, all you're going to do is close the paws off in the wood and the spirits are just going to lay on the top and it's not going to seep in and give you a, the, the good quality finish that you're after. So sand it 320 and give, the, give them... The spirit stains a chance to soak into the timber. Let's see, I just slap it. Stay. If there's any questions, feel free to ask as we're going along. So turn it back on. The one thing I didn't do there was turn the speed down when I sanded it. I should have. It doesn't detract it from what I've fit the finish has gone like. But if it had been you, as I say, it would have it would have probably had very, very small cracks on it.
Neat. So that is the trinket box finished. Get your grain orientation set so that you've got a really good got a couple of marks there that probably just need polishing out. Just a little bit more pressure. On it. I'm not going to glue this together, but I'll pass it round as the finished item and see how many times it falls apart on the floor. What glue would you use? 